Hi everyone, um, welcome to tonight's book launch. My name's Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet, and I'm very, very happy that we are here this evening to launch Mina Gorgi's second collection, Scale, which I have here, it's very exciting. Um, Mina is here, of course, and she's gonna read for us in a few moments, um, and I'm just gonna run over some housekeeping before, I, um, before we get started with the launch properly. So, um, so you know what's gonna happen this evening. We'll be together for about an hour, um, I can see that some of you have found the chat. Please do make sure when you use the chat that you select everyone from the drop down menu or you won't all be able to see each other's messages. Um, the default setting is hosts and panelists and it means that only we can see them, but you guys can't see each other. So make sure you select everyone um, and keep your messages coming in there throughout the evening. Let us know what you think of the reading. Um, please get involved in the conversation. Now, while Mina is reading to us later, um, I'm going to put the text up on screen for you just as a visual guide. You're in control of your own screen. If you need Mina to be bigger and the text to be smaller, you can do that. Just have a click around and see what you can do there. And if you have any technical problems, put them in the chat and I'll do my best to help you as we go through the event. We are also joined by Banu Kapil, um, which is a delight. She's going to be in conversation with Mina after the reading. Uh, and there will be also be time for you guys to get your own questions put to Mina by Banu. So as well as finding the chat box, please find another button. It says Q&A on it. And if you get your questions for Mina lined up in there, then Banu will be, be able to put them to her later on. <clears throat> Excuse me. OK, um, I think that's really everything. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce Banu, um, who I'm very, very happy is joining us this evening. Uh, Banu is the author of six books. Most recently, How to Wash a Heart, which came out with Pavilion and won the T.S. Eliot Prize. And in autumn of this year, which is basically now, um, that's exciting, um, Kelsey Street Press are going to publish Incubation, A Space for Monsters. So um, if you don't know Banu's work, which you should, go and check out those books. Um, and I will just ask her to join me on screen so we can begin. Thanks, Jazz. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the launch of Scale, the stunning new book by my friend Mina Gorgi. Scale, a book of poems that was written during lockdown, but also just before, in the time when it was possible to enter and exit architectures with casual physical freedom. I remember sitting outside the observatory with Mina, for example, just before we went in to look at the oldest map of the entire sky. Today, Mina Gorgi will take us through that red door once again. Mina Gorgi was born in Iran and lives in Cambridge, where she is Associate Professor at the Faculty of English, University of Cambridge and a fellow of Pembroke College. Her debut, Art of Escape, Carcanet, hello Carcanet, 2020, a Telegraph Book of the Month has been described as a collection of exquisite miniatures that suggest worlds, five books, intricate considered poems which encourage us to democratize our attention and empathy, much needed, that was me, The Guardian, not me, she has also written a study of John Clare's poetry and essays on weeds, rudeness, little things, and listening. This year, she has been awarded a British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship to complete a study of listening in and to romantic poetry. Scale is her second poetry collection. Um, and in introducing Mina, I also wanted to draw attention to this phenomenal review by Sean Hewitt, an extraordinary writer in their own right that just came out in the Irish Times, I believe just a week ago. Um, and this is it, I'm just gonna read from my special cut and paste um, situation here. Um, Sean Hewitt, Mina Gorgi is a poet who knows exactly what to say and how to say it. Continuing her fascination with brief imagistic and rich works Scale is a book of deep sonic attention. Gorgi, who is also a Cambridge academic with a specialism in romantic poetry and orality, carries her fascination with sound throughout this book. With an immense skill in crystalline language, crystalline, crystalline, 
Gorgi can paint a landscape, a soundscape, and an emotional core with breathtaking brevity. She draws our attention close to the page. The wood frogs lie in wait, frozen so hard. If dropped, they'd clink. There are tremors of personal experience here. The early days of sleeplessness after a newborn child are traced in a haunting image of a baby's face, cherry blossom seen through glass, sometimes unsettling, registering sounds almost out of earshot. Gorgi's poems are crafted through the technology of listening. Their scales move from the personal to the global, from the real to the dreamlike in unnerving and beautiful ways. Dear Mina, we're ready for the beauty of your poems. We're ready to be unnerved. Oh, hello, and thanks so much, Banu. And thank you all for coming along this evening. I'd also like to thank my editors, Michael and Jazz and John for their careful attention, advice and patience, and Becky and Alan and the Carcanet team for all their help and support. Thanks to my friends who commented on the poems and also to Julia Ricci for letting me use her gorgeous work on the cover. I'm grateful to my colleagues and students at Pembroke for inspiring conversations too. And I'd like to thank my family and above all, my husband, Zach and daughters, Ariana and Zarina for their support and humor, for their excitement and curiosity about the natural world the frozen fens, the giant moths and frogs and stars that have made their way into this collection. My grandparents arrived in this country from southern India, which has a tropical climate. I tried to imagine their first winter on this island, the shock of cold and snow. This is the first poem from the book. A red door opens into snow. What to leave behind? A bangle, gold, a pearl, an offering for the threshold left behind. This next poem carries on thinking about that first winter. Waiting for snow, we feel instead the emptiness of rain. Inside the house, it's cold. We have been waiting for the world to be forgiven for a moment into white. The pavement glitters crystalline with ice. Grandmother had never felt the snow before. She knew the touch of monsoon rain, humidity so thick the body slowed, before the shock of Edinburgh rain, soaking her sari with its cold and grey. How did their bodies, how do our bodies adapt to these shifts in temperature? As migrants, as people sharing a planet, experiencing climate change? How do we adapt to the shift in scale? How can we understand the force of scale on our lives? A few inches on a map can represent an enormous emotional as well as physical migration for generations. This next poem thinks about the experience of cold, about fellow creatures that have adapted to extreme cold. Cold. At the bottom of the Arctic, brittle stars. The temperature is permanently low or has been until now so little light. Currents 
carry whale song far away and far below bristleworms, anemones, occasionally crabs and eyeless creatures moving slow, untouched by light, invisible to stars. Imagine floating in Andromeda between two distant stars. Temperature of emptiness. A family of field mice huddling against the cold. Newt is at the edge of life, waiting for the temperature to rise. This little stillness leaves us cold. We hear so often about the catastrophic difference a tiny rise in temperature can have but the numbers and the warnings can be hard to take in, so abstract. Quite a few of the poems in scale explore the somatic, the felt experience of scale, of shifts in temperature, for example. And the next poem I'm going to read is called Thor. Thor. At what point does a life held in ice begin to cease? A woodsman carrying a heart still warm out of the forest. I am standing at the forest edge where foxgloves will appear. Ground is hard, white with frost. I'm interested in the way ice can hold secrets, stories and histories. Down the road from where I live, the British Antarctic Survey has a collection of ice cores made of compacted snow, some of which fell a very long time ago. I'm fascinated by the way ice can be a record of the past as a kind of historical document, the air bubbles, the ash particles caught in ice and what they can tell us. These next two poems think about that in different ways, about what is preserved in ice, about ice and memory, ice as memory. Trace. Read in ice a shifting world, patterns of wind, depth of snowfall in a given year memory of volcanoes long extinct. Those early days of broken sleep, a baby's face, cherry blossom seen through glass. Edges of leaves, white with frost, glisten. Ice cracks underfoot, bubbles rise, air trapped, wavering. Hearing me, darts free. Excuse me. We know that the ice caps are melting. We know that the glaciers on the Himalaya, Karakoram and Hindu Kush mountains are melting much faster than expected. We know that we are causing this to happen with devastating consequences. In this next poem, I want to think about the ice from another perspective, about the power of ice to consume us. In ice, they found a wolf intact, its face and fur still legible after 40,000 years. Cold preserves the living for a time slowing the heart to almost still. Snow will fall, covering our tracks, ice crystallise inside our bones. What can survive? The glaciers advance. 
This next poem is about a North American frog that's um, evolved an amazing way to survive the cold. They don't just hibernate, they somehow survive being frozen. All winter long, the wood frogs lie in wait, frozen so hard, if dropped, they clink. Inside their cells, something is waiting, waiting for spring, a change of key, before they wake and sing in high-pitched chirps and peeps and trills that settle for a moment into something like a pattern. Quite a few of the poems in this collection experience um, sounds in different ways, think about listening and, and focus on the experience of sound. And I suppose scale has a musical sense too that I was interested in. And this next poem is about the strange peeps and chirps and trills that you hear when inside an MRI machine, a very weird music if you've ever heard it. MRI. Inside the dark, a high-pitched click, a low vibrating hum MP fades into silence I can't scan. Imagine a lake, water lapping on the shore, a heart, a cricket singing, hum of bees and linnets' wings. What has it heard? This next poem is about sound formations, the sounds and the amazing patterns made by skeins of pinkfoot geese arriving on these shores, coming in from Iceland and from Greenland for the winter, about now, round about now. Um, if you've ever seen it, it's an extraordinary spectacle and an extraordinary sound. At the edge of England, dusk across the sky v m w m v i more foreign than icelandic runes the skein of geese is spelling out a secret song like sacred script i couldn't understand or sound and if i mouthed it wrong she'd pinch my hand and then the sky calls out a wild, familiar cry, reminding us not to despair. Our fears are only wintering, like letters disappearing into sky. Not all the things we hear are that inspiring. I experience tinnitus from time to time, which can be quite annoying. And when I found out about this ancient remedy carved on a stone tablet in the library of King Ashurbanipal at Nineveh, I was hopeful. Tinnitus in Nineveh. The library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh held many remedies. If the hands of a ghost seize on a man and his ears sing or whisper, stuff them with charms, fumigate with rue or frankincense, find a blacksmith or a poet to distract the gnat with clang of metal striking metal, chisel striking stone. Quite a few of the poems in this collection range across different timescales from Ashurbanipal in the 6th century BC, but also further back, thinking about deeper time, back to the Ice Age and further back to the birth and death of stars. One of the questions I want to ask is, at what scale does the question of being native matter? At what scale does it stop mattering? At what scale of time or space is something or someone native? Here in Cambridge, hippos used to wallow in the shallows. In fact, if you visit the Earth Sciences Museum um, in Cambridge, you can see the skeleton of one of those hippos. They dug it up in the Barrington chalk pits just nearby. Hippos aren't native to these parts any longer. 
but there are plenty of creatures and plants that are fairly recent arrivals. Parakeets that squawk, for example, in the silver birch branches across southwest London, where I grew up. Um, I've always felt a kind of kinship with those parakeets, being a recentish migrant myself. And the next short poem is called Parakeet. Parakeet. Flash of green up in the silver birch, neon squawking gaudy green against the dappled quiet of suburbia, its lawnmowers and distant radios. The question of what is and isn't native starts to look very different if we change scale. This next poem I'll read about thinks about this question. It's about survival, it's about resilience, and some of the creatures that make their homes in extreme and precarious terrain. A little mouse, a striped snake called Darwin's racer, for example. Field notes from the edge of a volcano. Pinatuba mouse. Is the ground warm? Does your heart sense the volcano's rhythms? How do you know when to run? Darwin's racer, you have no natural predators on Volcano Island, only the volcano. Now in the blue light, the world is quiet. The amaryllis opened overnight Three flowers, pinkish, red, quietly look out. The tiny flies around its stalk are sitting still. In England, the volcanoes are extinct. They have been naturalised to beauty spots, a landscape for adventurers to scale and to admire. Acadian folds erupting into daffodils. Underneath a memory of fire solidified, hematite, cobalt, graphite, magnetite, the rocks are moving at a different scale. The daffodils beside the lake were brought here by the Romans, some say for their healing powers. What is a native plant according to which scale of time? Triassic ferns, flowerless, rows of russet spores, braille to the wind. Pleistocene fir trees sending pollen into future air, into a forest where wolves will track the footprints of two children, abandoned in the dark. At night, the sky is glittering with sparks. Between the darkness and the dark, the planets with their quiet moons appear. Quite a few of the poems in the collection are inspired by looking at the stars up at the night sky or on charts. Um, at the sky map I saw with Banu at the observatory on Muddingly Road. I'm interested in how the stars play with our sense of scale in powerful ways. Here's one poem written during lockdown at a time when we were all trapped indoors. The world seemed to shrink, surrounded by mess and clutter. I started to dream of space and cool expanses of distance. Pluto. I dream of distance, cold, untroubled distance, the quiet further reaches of our sun, far out from Saturn's icy rings, cold, remote, so beautiful, planet of the underworld, guarded by Charon, Kerberos, Styx, Nyx and Hydra, we see your features, almost familiar, canyons, ice plains, mountains topped with mercury snow. 
This next poem is called Message from an Asteroid. Message from an Asteroid. Out there, above the furthest limit of our sky, on some fast orbit bound for who knows where, your blue heart is calling to cobalt veins inside the earth, crusts of cobalt under oceans on the skin, the lips of submarine volcanoes, reminding them of wild formations, forces of fire. I'll end my um, readings this evening with the very first poem which I wrote for the collection, which was inspired by the visit to the Institute of Astronomy on Maddingley Road with Banu. We saw the oldest um, map of the entire sky one cold morning in early February, I think it was a couple of years ago. The Institute has a red door and inside there's this ancient star map which reveals the constellations, including the constellations of the Southern Hemisphere, which I'd never seen before. I'd never seen or heard of the names of so many stars in another hemisphere. I was inspired by what was revealed by that beautiful map and also what wasn't revealed. Scale. The map reveals so many stars, two constellations in the shape of bears, a peacock, Parvo, in the southern hemisphere, the spaces between galaxies, the emptiness, the not quite emptiness, it doesn't show, the single atom H in every cubic metre, the atom that is not quite still, how cold it is between the galaxies, the snowdrops in the garden, the morning after frost. Thanks so much for listening. Oh, thank you, Mina. That was so beautiful. After hearing and reading like the drafts of your poems over the last two years, that was really special. Thank you. And there's lots of lovely messages. I hope that we can save that chat. Um, uh, thank you. Yes, lots of words like exquisite and beautiful and superb and inspiring. Um, Mina, I can see that some questions have come into the chat. Don't worry about it. I'm going to um, read them aloud um, when it's time, but I just wanted to ask you, I thought I was going to ask you a question, like to tell us a story of lockdown or a kind of a, a memory of the making of the book, but I, I felt like that came back when you were talking about the visit to the observatory. So instead, I want to ask you about something I've never heard you say before. And you said um, the somatic experience of scale. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, so quite often when we think about scale, we think about, you know, I don't know, the, the, the scale at the bottom of a map or different shifts in numerical scale or a given a lot of information which is quite abstract often um, and hard to understand um, and, and very cerebral often when we think about shifting scales or about historical time scales and it can be very very hard for example to understand the significance of shifts in scale like a, a tiny shift in temperature for example um, and so I wanted to try and think about that experience um, in the body, on the body, the experience of temperature, how uh, the sense of shifting scale might feel in the body, the kind of vertigo when you look at a star map or the kind of vertigo when you look up at space, the, the sort of the sense of how our sense of scale shifts. So yeah, to, so really was to think about it in the body, on the body, the kind of felt experiences we have of shifts in scale so that it started to become real in a way which I think sometimes numbers and sometimes 
a certain kind of language isn't um, for many of us. Um, so I think that's um, how I started to try and try and understand scale. Um, you know, that very real sense of claustrophobia when the world seems to get smaller during lockdown, for example, or um, that sense that we really feel compressed in our bodies in, in a certain way, and the sense of, um, and, and how looking at um, a map of the stars can help us uh, shift our perspective and, and, and feel differently but also you know we, we seeing you know thinking about migration thinking about my family and many who many who've moved on a map just a few inches and how easy it is to represent that in this way in this small uh, scale and visually in this way but you know how strange it seemed to me um the kind of physical and emotional and bodily experience of those migrations which looks so um um, elegant and beautiful when you draw kind of arrows on a map, for example. So I wanted to think about the strangeness of representation, the strangeness of the abstract representation of scale and try and bring it back to the body and think a bit about uh, how we um, how we feel it, if that makes sense. Um, beautiful, Mina. I think that is such a, like a stunning like response and somehow we all um, drink uh, watery milk with turmeric one day and listen to this <laughs> transcribe it. I don't know where that came from. But just to kind of note that this is quite different from, um, you know, empire like notions of scale and cartography that are about zooming in, then zooming out in ways that are so, uh, you know, extractive. So I've been kind of thinking about how you're working. The thing that I think we're calling delicate and exquisite is actually for me, like this interesting mixture of what's emerging is also what's endangered. Um, and that's actually language from the thinker Syra Pinto, like this link between um, like what is precarious life? And just listening today, it's like these niches or these folds in the ice, this dislodging, this melting, and you know, a theory of trace um, that I feel that you're building in ways that I'm not used to, perhaps in contemporary poetry. But anyway, just that the links between the endangered and the emergent that your that scale is making. Um, Thank you. Well, yes. Mina, um, and I see that you have had some crystals on your um, bookshelf. So I luckily found some selenite. Um, oh, I, thank you. I just link my selenite to your. Um, oh, I'll give you my uh, my oh. amethyst oh. and pyrite. Oh, hello. Oh. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> thank you. All right, we've now established the diagonal axis of the crystalline um, entities in um, Cambridge and Colorado, where I am today in the United States. And I see we have several beautiful questions. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and um, I'll just uh, begin. Um, so Michael Schmidt has uh, written, one of the joys of working with you, Mina, is how you lineate and relineate a poem to find its sound. Yes, Michael, I can attest to that. I've seen many uh, rocks and to remove its surplus. What a good word. Can you talk a little about how you regard the line and the place of continual revision in making a poem? How do you know it's finished or abandoned? Thanks, Michael. Mina. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And um, thanks. Um, yeah, it's a very good question and it's so true to the process of writing and editing uh that i the that the line that it ha has to emerge there's always a lot more to the the poem when i start it and it's a process of gradually removing as you say the surplus removing the extra words until the lines sing somehow they have to sing and they have to um hold their own in that space um the, my lines are quite short very often actually and i 
I find it quite difficult to write a long line, in fact, because I like the feeling of space and whiteness around around the lines. But also, I think because the way um, I like to hear a line, too. So um, I read it out very often. I read it aloud and again and again. And I also edit it and I edit it and I I uh, often email it to myself and to friends and to kind editors. I email and, and back and forth and back and forth. And in a way, somehow the precarious, well, not precarious, but kind of, what's the word? Um, the informal feeling of email seems to help me to not worry too much because it seems you know, about making small changes and I can make them back again. So I feel it helps the process a little bit. Um, whereas a kind of, yeah, so I start with a scribble and then I read it out aloud and then, um, but it has to, and I think I start often usually with too many adjectives and too much in the line and gradually like a kind of uh, extraction of a crystal out of stone, the, I hope the poem comes and the crystal emerges of, of, of sound and, and it sounds usually right. Uh, I hope when it when it's finished and, and I, I suppose that there's a lot of pressure on the word at the end of the line so it has to, to bear the pressure so I have to think quite hard about which word I leave there at the end of the line and whether I want you know what kind of pauses I want I mean you know I guess everyone writing a line has to think about those things but if the line's shorter then in a way it becomes these questions become a bit more um, pressured and intense you know uh, what kind of pause what kind of space what what kind of emphasis do you want on on that word and can it bear it and usually to be honest it's it's that whether the phrase sings in the line I, I suppose it must be that Robert Frost sentence sounds idea ultimately the idea that there are kind of a natural patterns of cadence and sound and, and to try and find those um, those sentence sounds if I've understood it right to try and find those natural cadences which shine out that which sound out as a uh, units and and bring them out in the poem I hope that makes sense um, I, I don't always manage it <laughs> no, no, no. well that's fantastic and just to kind of note um, this kind of diagonal tracing between this scribble you know, I start with a scribble to this. You repeated this twice. It is oh. really eerie and so beautiful. Oh. Can you didn't say can I bear it? Can it bear it? Yeah. So this kind of ontological tolerance, you know, like this kind of word that comes at the end, you know, of the poem, can it bear? Can it bear it? So um thank you once again. There's something like your work with ephemeral materials or you know, very this kind of light touch mixed with um, density is so interesting, and we're noticing this about you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, next question um, from G. C. Waldrop, uh, another astonishing um, poet um, of the little edges and wildness of all kinds. Hi, Mina. <laughs> I adore what you do, and within the brief stanzas of these poems, you mentioned in terms of the immigrant experience adapting to a shift in scale. Mm -hmm. As you read, I was thinking of the tension between inside and outside across these poems, and of the stanza as a room, the stanza as part of whatever we mean by scale. One of the quoted reviews called your poems miniatures, but I'm not quite sure that's right, or I'm not sure that's quite right. Could you talk a bit about how the stanza functions for you across this collection, the rooms the poem lives in or speaks from? Thanks, thanks, GC. Thank you, GC, and um, thanks for that question. It's a uh... I'm, I'm I'm looking through the book again, and I'm yeah. The it has got very short. Um, a lot of the poems have these very tiny stanzas, and sometimes punctuated by this little star, which um, I wanted to keep in there. Uh, I think for me, each little stanza works in a way as a kind of complete unit, as a little high, well, not a haiku, but a kind of has that feeling of a glimpse. Um, a poet. I admire Wordsworth talks about seeing by glimpses now when he's old. I see by glimpses now when age comes on, I hardly see at all. He's talking about his um, inspiration, sources of his inspiration. And in a funny way, these little short stanzas, these little short 
um, moments in the poems I'm hoping are kind of little glimpses, um, sonic glimpses or visceral glimpses, if that's a thing, in uh, which are, so I think that's that's partly what, what, what I was um, trying to do. They're not working as stanzas as a unit of argument in, in the way that some stanzas do. Sometimes they're working as a unit of voice, like in that poem Thor, and I've kind of italicised the middle stanza, a woodsman carrying a heart still warm out of the forest. It's a kind of slightly different voice, but um, but yeah, really, I, th I think they were working as, as, as um, these short glimpses, um, the poems that have stanzas in that way. It's interesting mm -hmm. about, about the inside and the outside, the in, indoors and outdoors, because I mean, obviously, in different cultures, that, that functions very differently. I mean, um, in um, Iranian culture, which I'm familiar with, um, you know, um, being, there's a kind of there are different words for the indoors and outdoors. Uh, there's a different kind of way of being indoors and outdoors. Indoors is more informal, uh, often more relaxed. Um, uh, you can be at ease in a certain way. I mean, I suppose in a way that's probably true in um, many other cultures. But there are these specific um, ways of describing them. And outdoors, you know, you have to be you're presentable. You're or you're certainly. Um, uh, more formal so, so there are and I hadn't really thought about the cultural indoors and outdoors and the, the kind of way in which that may shift when you're an immigrant from one kind of indoors and outdoors to another kind of indoors and outdoors and I suppose I must have adjusted to the different kinds of indoors and outdoors I mean in in Iran for example where I visited as a kid and where I was born you know it's very marked the indoors and outdoors for women have to wear hijab when you go outdoors so you're very much it's a very much a defined way of a visually defined indoors and outdoors too um, for example uh, I mean it was more more so in this country here some time ago I believe um, so yeah no I haven't really thought that's a really interesting question. I mean, certainly for me, the kinds of language I heard and experienced, the kinds of rhythms indoors and outdoors were, were very different, the kinds of, but I think, again, that's something very familiar to most people, like, you know, they have a kind of intimate, familiar register with their families at, at home, and then, you know, in public, a different kind of speaking. So, but I suppose that may be also that kind of sense of familiarity and intimacy is something I'm very interested in poetry, kind of indoors poetry, why I'm drawn to a poet like Claire, John Claire, who doesn't write with a, a kind of bold, uh, a grand public um, voice, but, but writes with a more familiar, intimate voice. Maybe it could be called an indoor voice. I'm not sure. But, but so that's what really got me thinking, G see about indoors and outdoors in terms of cadences and in terms of rhythms but I hadn't ever thought about it in terms of stanza so thanks so much for getting me thinking about that question I hope that tangle was some kind of answer but it was um, okay. a really stunning tangle there the scribble, <laughs> and tangle, the scribble the third minute stunning um, we have um, another question from uh, another extraordinary poet, Holly Caulfield Carr. Oh, hello. Thank you, Holly. Um, Holly writes, um, I've loved hearing Mina speak about the different scales of attention at work in her poems, from those clinking tiny frogs to those slower, longer sounds of a whole landscape. And I wondered if Mina might tell us more about the different scales of listening while writing a poem. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. That's a great question. And um, yes, there's a kind of listening for some, which starts sometimes in a kind of field work, being outdoors um, and, and, and just listening into the landscape or uh, a, a kind of tuning in to um, the world around or to the body. That, that There's that kind of listening, um, which takes you into a kind of... Uh, kind of attention to the world around you so there's that's um and I think listening can help you bring you into the world in a certain way and so that, that that's the, I think the first kind of listening is a kind of um a tuning in to the world um around you in that way to and, and often sounds listening into a, to a bird or to um the wind or to trees um and the sounds they make can be that kind of anchoring um but but then of course there's the listening for listening for um 
words which you need for a poem because a, a poem doesn't just translate you know um some poets attempt to like translate birds a song straight onto the page but most poems are listening for a, di uh, a different kind of sound and music and so yet yeah, there's the listening for the cadences and sometimes poems don't come out of you know standing in front of a hedge at all they come from a phrase that you know you hear um someone say in passing or um, um on uh on tv or you know it, it you, you might be in a in a just hear, hear someone in a cafe and there's a cadence that stays with you and that cadence or, or you might read um a phrase and that phrase has a sound which then grows into a poem and so there's that kind of listening listening for the music of words listening for the cadence of words that you read or that you hear that then you play with and you um uh that, that, that generates the poem and then there's the listening to the drafts of the poem the listening to the po listening to the versions and to the words you've got on the page until they sound like a poem listening for the line that uh, michael was talking about listening for the end of the line listening for the pauses so yeah lots of different kinds of listening and the making of the poem um yeah that, that's a really interesting question thanks holly um yeah thank you thank you holly and Mina, um, maybe when I return to Cambridge, we can weave a net with the other poets and hang it in the branches to catch words. <laughs> Side note, everyone welcome. Um, and maybe related to that question and this kind of these multiple different kinds of ways that you, you know, approach practice, Mina, we have a question from Olivia Smith. Do you think we retreat, it's interesting, to different scales to escape I'm thinking of the art of escape, your previous collection, Mina. Do you think we retreat to different scales to escape or find safety? To zoom in and out for a kind of release from things that are difficult to look at? Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. That's a really good question. Um, and, and it's definitely true that certain kinds of um, scale shifting can offer a way out or a way through um, difficult things that focusing in on um, a detail might help us um, find our equilibrium if we are uh, having a, in, a, in a difficult landscape, for example, or um, shifting scales might help us um, find a way around a problem maybe seeing it from another perspective so i think definitely there are ways in which shifting scale um either uh you know thinking and i suppose that's why people and um, not just poets all people have loved looking up at the stars because they are reminding us of our very small um scale and and, and so on in the universe and, and so, so in a way um in, in things that in a way there's a great comfort in that and that people have been doing that for a very long time indeed um looking uh looking uh, up at is a kind of shifting scale um and looking very closely at the leg of a ladybird is allowing us to really be absorbed by something in a way which might offer us kinds of relief too. Yeah, so definitely there are kind of psychological benefits, I think, from shifting scale, but also aesthetic uh, benefits <laughs> too, to, uh, I think, Emma. yeah, maybe why I did it so often. Hmm. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, um, Olivia. And maybe just to bring in you know, also the language of anchoring, Mina, that you used in your previous response, anchoring in the sound of the wind in the trees or the branches. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so I have a, I'm just going to drop down um, and move past Michael's next question. It will maybe end with bundling Michael and Peter's question about the eye. I'm going to read aloud the question from Alicia. Um, Nina, could you drink a sip of water while I read this question? <laughs> yeah. yeah, have some water <laughs> or tea. Um, Alicia, thank you. Another amazing poet. Um, Alicia writes, I love the sequence poems like field notes that have shorter moments held together by section breaks. What do you see happening in those breaks or pauses? when? Are you compelled to collect many moments in a single poem versus keeping them contained? Both forms are done so beautifully. 
Oh, thank you for that question. Um, oh, thank Lucy. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Alicia. Um, well, that's a, another really good question, and, and thanks um, for it. Um, it was writing the longer sequences of shorter poems was a big change for me when when I did this book. I think the, the earlier book was much more um, made up of tiny little poems, so it felt like a very brave step to start putting some of them together into uh, something larger to create kinds of narrative which I hadn't done before and when I realised that you could do this kind of glimpse narrative uh, where, where it could be broken where it didn't have to be continuous or a kind of great sweep of um, tune or argument where it could be um, delicately um, uh, sort of um, delicately emerge in these little glimpses, then it was quite liberating for me. Um, though sometimes still there's a, the poem seems to find its own ending. And I guess that's, if it's shorter, you, you, yeah. So it, it just, I guess it depends where the poem started also. Um, if it's, if there was in that cadence that started the poem off, if there was a short poem only, then the short poem comes out and I guess if there was a longer poem of um, shifts like that then that's that's what comes but that's sort of I suppose I'm not very I haven't really thought about it um, 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 Alicia in, in a way I've just kind of done it but it's really good to have a prompt to think about it and also to challenge myself maybe to do something a bit longer because I um, I haven't done and and partly that was through fear of not being able to sustain it but maybe um, thinking about it might help with that too. Um, so yes, I think it, it's partly just to do with the material and whether it lends itself to a short or a long poem and whether or not, um, and I suppose like the, sh the, the ones which are shorter glimpses in a way might be more like kind of uh, variations in music or something like that, that they're kind of something slightly similar or a shift, a shift, a shift like that. Um, uh, and that couldn't quite happen and you couldn't quite do it so I'm trying to un decompressing something maybe yeah well, not not quite an answer but thank you but it, definitely the wheels are in motion so thank you for asking that question yeah um, yeah thank you and thank you for that really interesting phrase which I can see Alicia's put into the chat as well glimpse narrative um, really <laughs> Um, and so I see uh, a few more questions coming into the chat. So um, if you have it there, would you, actually, I don't think we have enough time for many more questions. And so, and I'm so sorry to um, uh, Simon and um, is it uh, Miri, I'm sorry not to be able to get to your questions. Um, but I think we should close with one question. We have Michael again and Peter Adair responding to what Peter calls the lack of I, so unusual today. Um, <laughs> Michael um, elaborates, Michael Schmidt, can you talk a little about your unusual use of the I, which subjects itself to things experienced, hmm. moving well away from mere subjectivity, creating a shared space. Um, and so, um, Nina, just if you could uh, respond to that and uh, we'll move towards the I, think, I think I was always very nervous of writing just about a kind of uh, in a straightforwardly confessional way, uh, partly, and I wanted, yeah, I'm not, it's a it's a it's a complicated thing at some level because I suppose I wanted. To be able to find and experience things which were shareable and more, if not universal, then um, sh shareable, and uh, which might be something to do with coming from a a, a different cultural background and and wanting to find commonality and wanting to find kinds of experiences and so on that that could be shared uh, in poetry too, and not just. Um, if that makes sense. It might be something to do with that I am wanting to um, find in poetry a language that's shareable like that. Um, I also found um, 
the 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 it's a vulnerable thing to say I a lot, I think, and I think that I found it so, and and so I wanted there was a kind of safety in uh, not saying I in that particular kind of um, subjective voice, and I suppose I enjoy that feeling, which, uh, and I'm interested in um, the poem as you know the. the the poem sounds and the poem's presence and not just you know me who makes a cup of tea and and, and, and spills it on the table but you know I, when I'm interested in when I read poets and poems I'm interested in what the language is doing and that's what most important to me what the language is doing and what's in the language and and so I think I don't say so much I made a cup of tea but or whatever it may be but um, I'm interested although that didn't sound too bad in fact it almost rhymed but but so I'm interested in, and that might be to do with it that I that I'm interested in those um, deep uh, sound patterns and shared shared um, histories in, in language and I'm wanting to reach those maybe rather than um, talk about those other kinds of I not to say that those are not valid experiences um, just to say that maybe well maybe I wasn't maybe I was wanting to get away from those experiences sometimes or maybe I was just wanting to in po in poems to find um a different kind of space um I don't know if that answers the question uh yeah hmm. um Mina that feels like a beautiful place to close our time together with you um this other kind of space I wish you we all wish you the very best for this coming year of writing and we're going to keep celebrating your beautiful book and learning from you about um, the body, the wind, the branches, the crystals and so on. <laughs> See you later for a cup of tea. Thank you everyone and um, <laughs> I'll turn things over to Katrin at rest. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, thank you, Mina, for reading so beautifully. And thank you, Banu, for hosting the conversation so generously. Thank you guys for your beautiful questions. It's been a really, really pleasurable evening. Um, and of course, thank you for paying to be here. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, that's not the message I want to send you. I want to send you the link to buy the book, um, which I am going to do. Um, but if you don't want to do it right now, also, you can uh, check your emails tomorrow because we'll be sending you an email and it'll have the link and the discount code so you can buy um, your discounted copy of the book for you and for everyone you know, which you should definitely do. Um, and I suppose the last thing for me to say is please join us again. Um, our next launch is on the 28th of September. We're launching a debut collection by Celia Sarando. Um, you can get the information on our website. Um, so that's it really. Thank you. Congratulations, Mina. Um, and well done. It's been it's been really, really, really lovely. Um, <laughs> thank yeah. You. Thanks thank so you. much for coming, everybody, and thank you, Jazz and Banu and, and everyone at Karkanet. Thanks a lot. It's been a uh, oh, there's Ari. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Oh. Thanks, everyone. I'll leave the chat open for a couple of minutes so you can oh. get your last minute messages in there. Oh, um, that's great. But Thank I'm going to close us off now. So, Amazing. yeah, Thanks well done, Mina. Thank you.